I'm ready. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is the uh, January meeting of the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District Board. Um, let's, uh, I'll call the, call the meeting in order. Uh, Arlene, may we have a roll call, please? Yes. Director Hoffman? Here. Director Adams? Here. Director Edwards? Here. Director Evans? Here. Director Byrne? Here. Director Riley? Here. And Director Potter? Here. Okay. Uh, will you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? And uh, Director Edwards, would you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, the next item, uh, welcome back, Mayor Potter. Uh, he has already taken his oath of office. Oh, okay. So Wonderful. Thank you. Bypass that one. Okay. We'll move that. <coughs> Are there any other additions or corrections? Okay. All right, seeing none, then um, we'll accept the agenda as is. Uh, and then, as, of course, as the next item, we'd like to, to welcome Mayor Potter back to the board. Thank you. Congratulations. Good to see you. <laughs> All right, then. Well, then, without any further ado, I will open up the floor to um, oral communications. Anyone ad wishing to address the board? on any uh, consent calendar information items, closed session items, or matters not listed on the agenda may do so now. We'll limit your time to three minutes. Um, would you uh, start by stating your name at the lectern, please? And Pardon me. Yeah, my name is Dave Lesakar. I'm a homeowner in Seaside, and I just went out for a walk on the beach this past Sunday after the 0.16 inches of rain, and I was sort of surprised to see a lot of fresh water running into the ocean from Roberts Lake coming from um, up, in, you know, from um, the Canyon Del Rey Creek, and. Um, Along the creek, in addition to frog ponds, there's a number of wetlands in there that um, whose capacity for water retention and water percolation, I believe, could be easily increased by some low berms and check, check dams, and the water retained could easily be pumped up to the, um, the high, deep sand dunes um, just a half a mile or a mile away in the over the seaside um, groundwater basin. So it's just a not another opportunity to recover some fresh water for the groundwater basin. Thank you, Mr. Lescar. Anyone else? <coughs> Melody Chrislock. Um, so this whole feasibility thing started with the high cost of water. And during the feasibility sessions, I noticed that some people were contesting that we actually had the most expensive water in the country and kind of acting like that was just campaign rhetoric. So what I did is um, I brought a copy of this for all of you tonight. Arlene has them. This is the 2015 study that, that Food and Water Watch did and the 2017 update that we based that on. And I thought it might be really valuable for you to all have a copy. It's um, the largest study ever done on the cost of water, public versus private, across the whole country. They looked at 500 of the largest water providers in the nation and they took the 5,000 gallons per month or 60,000 gallons a year 
as the average to look at the cost of that in 500 different systems. And we came out the highest in 2017. In 2015, when this was originally done, we were number nine. And then by two years later, we had jumped to that most expensive. So this report shows two things. One, that we have the most expensive water in the country. And the second, it compares the cost of public versus privately owned water. And you can see by looking at this that it's quite a bit different. The percentage is much lower. But the one thing that this doesn't show, because we have tiered rates. So if you've got 5,000 gallons, you're paying about $100 a month here, tier two bill. And it was argued that this was based on excessive water use. No way. Tier two is very moderate water use. So if you've got a hundred dollar bill, water bill a month, you're paying the most expensive water in the country. If you've got less than that, then you're paying less than the most expensive. But a lot of people have two, three, four, five, six hundred dollar a month water bills. So they're paying five, six times the most expensive water in the country. So anyway, just thought this would be a value maybe to the consultants to look at and for you guys for sure to, to really have something to look at to see the comparisons. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chris Lott. <coughs> Dan Turner, Monterey. The politics surrounding the two recent appointments to this board really stink. Bob Brown knew that he was very ill last spring and could have resigned back then, allowing an election in November to fill out the remainder of his term. But instead, he chose not to resign until October, which enabled the old board to select his successor, which they did at their November meeting. He could have resigned after the November board meeting, which would have allowed the new board to make that selection. So three of the most anti-public water uh, board members, two of them lame ducks, were able to select the person to fill his seat. It is most likely, judging from the election results in Division 5, that an election would have resulted in a supporter of Measure J having won that seat, which was exactly what the above process, which doesn't pass the smell test, was designed to prevent. However, that sort of partisan political conniving pales in comparison to the way that Dave Potter was placed on the board. It is not defensible to say that because Mayor Kerr was a little late for that meeting, it was OK, morally or ethically, even though it might be legal to proceed with the vote without her. They knew she was coming. Dave wouldn't have been elected to this board if Mayor Kerr had been there for the vote, at least not on the first ballot. So I hope I won't hear any sanctimonious hypocrisy from the pro calam members of this board uh, main, about maintaining impartiality, because those two appointments have been anything but impartial. Another thing I'd rather not hear anything about is the need for 13,000 acre feet of water annually for this area. That's what we used 10 years ago. However, as the cost of water has increased, our usage has declined, and that usage has decreased mostly due to the increase in cost, not due to low flow shower heads or one gallon toilets or a feeling of civic responsibility. Now, water usage will not increase, even if we had more water than we knew what to do with as long as the price remains high. And I don't know of anyone who thinks the price of water is going to decrease here, aside from the savings we might realize as a result of getting rid of cal -Am. Decreasing the number of acre feet we say we need annually in our discussions and computations from 13,000 to 9 to 10,000 acre feet is important because it makes it obvious that we do not need cal -Am's desal plant in Marina, which will bankrupt residential ratepayers if it is ever built. You all know, or you should know, that the combination of the 3,500 acre feet we can continue to take from Carmel Valley, plus the 3,500 acre feet from Pure Water Phase 1, plus another 2,000 acre feet from a Phase 2 of Pure Water fulfills our current water requirement. If we decide that we want more water than that, we can build a proper public regional desal plant in conjunction with Marina, Salinas, <coughs> and whoever else would like to participate. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Good evening, uh, board members, and welcome to uh, former board member and new board member, Mr. Potter. Um, secondly, I wasn't going to speak, but uh, with all due respect to Mr. Turner, my neighbor, um, 
I can tell you as a real estate agent that the small business community is strangled because of lack of water. I just came from a two-hour Monterey City Council meeting where they sp struggled for two hours to figure out the Fort Ord lands. They have 65 acre feet of water for 126 acres. It's not enough to do diddly. And trying to figure out how can they use the limited amount of water that is available supposedly from the Marina Coast Water District, <coughs> which I think may be for verging on paper water, but that's my personal opinion. But water, the shortage of water, because we do not have a long-term sustainable water supply, is absolutely critical. And I, I won't even get into affordable housing. The City Council this afternoon, Monterey, discussed the problem with infill housing. There's no water available for the lots where infill housing could be allowed. So for housing, affordable housing especially, which is critical, and small businesses. And small businesses are the backbone of jobs on the Monterey Peninsula. Our major other employers, which is the military, Pebble Beach Corporation, they're not going to have any major um, uh, expansion of jobs. So small businesses are the only opportunity we have to grow jobs within our local community. That's why it's criti critical. You've heard me say it before that have been around a long-term sustainable water supply and saying we only need 8,000 acre feet, that is one of the biggest lies perpetrated that we've had lately. And repeating it often is not going to make it true. We need additional water for the community. Thank you. Yeah, Tom Raleigh from Citizen of Monterey and also Vice President of Monterey Peninsula Taxpayers. So these were my personal comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raleigh. Good evening. My name is Barbara Moore. I'm from Monterey. I just wanted to say uh, there's a lot of people in the room, so it's very hard to hear you, Ms. Evans. So when the board members speak, if you could please pull the microphone close to you because it was really hard to hear. And I see a lot of the microphones are set kind of far back. So I'd ask that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Anyone else wishing to speak? Michael Bear, Carmel Valley. I deeply object to the appointment of Mr. Potter to this board. He was appointed under very suspect circumstances. He got three, three votes out of the six mayors, so he failed to get a majority of the board. He got a majority of a quorum of the board. He got three out of five that were present at the January 4th countywide mayor's meeting. The sixth member, Allison Kerr, was late by 15 minutes to that meeting, and the board had uh, already voted Mr. Potter to this seat. Now, the reason she was late, she was talking to her city manager. This is the newly elected mayor of Delray Oaks. She was talking to her city manager, Dino Peak, Pick. The city manager, uh, who was the former city manager for Jerry Edelin, the former mayor, who most certainly would have voted for Mr. Potter, because they used to have a 4-2 majority on the board until the, the changes of the mayors in the 2018 <coughs> election. So they only got three. Now the irony is that I went to complain about this at their, their first meeting of the year, the 10th, and they were going to the, pick, um, pick their officers, but Mr. Oglesby wasn't there. And he had asked that they would continue the meeting until the next uh, tentative date is January 31st, so they could choose who the mayors are going to be. So they're, they're happy to wait several weeks for Mr. Oglesby, but they couldn't wait 15 minutes for Ms. Kerr. Mr. Potter has a long history as a politician on this peninsula, over 20 years as a supervisor. Well, 20 years as a supervisor. I voted for you the first three times. I voted for Mr. Del Piero, and I campaigned against you when Mary Adams ran. And over those 20 years, well, let's go to 2009. I want to cut to the chase, when the regional project. 
in 2009 to 2011. I, I go to a meeting called RAMP. It's on Mondays. There's people with deep knowledge who've been fighting the water battle for more than 10 years and followed closely what happened in 2009 to 2011. And he undid the deal. He was part of the reason the deal was undone. We'd have, we'd have desal water now if that regional plan had been built in 2012. He was, he's, a, he's part of Cal-Am. He is a mole. He is a direct line. Whatever you guys are talking about in closed session, the public will not trust that this guy won't be going to the business coalition in Cal-Am and tell him what's going on. So I think you have two choices. You find a way to reverse the decision, or you make everything open, everything public, so we all know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bear. Madam Chair, uh, John Origi, Coalition of Peninsula Businesses. I'd like to respond to a couple sets of comments. Um, I've known Mayor Potter, Dave Potter, Councilman Potter, Supervisor Potter now for a number of years. Uh, I can honestly say on many of his voting records, he frankly did not vote to the side of business. I think what everyone is forgetting here as we talk about the yes on J people, I can count several names sitting across this table that came out publicly in support of yes on J. The one thing uh, Mayor Potter does have that most of the people along that sit at this table today don't have is experience of water. From his years on water management, from his years as a sitting supervisor, and I actually remember Dave when he was a city council member for the city of Monterey and sat on the planning commission prior. Water at that time was becoming a problem. So I would say if you're talking about an unbalanced board, I think with the election of Mayor Potter, the board has become more balanced. Uh, there is a group of us obviously out there. We're referred to as Friends of cal -M, which is totally incorrect. Who we are are people that are very much for the desal plant. We personally don't care who owns it, but without water, as was spoken very eloquently by Tom Raleigh, we know how much water we need. The coalition has been in the game for over eight years. We've been to Sacramento, we've been to San Francisco, and what we're looking for is just a balanced board, a group that will look at the facts objectively. And as far as we are concerned, Dave Potter is the perfect elected official to represent the mayors because of his experience in water over several decades. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Narigi. Hello, uh, my name is Anna Thompson and I live in Carmel. Um, I would like to say a couple things about the feasibility study. Um, in my estimation, the feasibility study requires estimation of costs and benefits. Excuse Would me, Ms. Thompson. Yes. That is an agendized item, so you will it have is? the it is. So you will have the opportunity to comment on it at that time. Wonderful. Could I make a comment about uh, the the uh, for the business? The, the prior gentleman said something. Yes, you may. About that uh, it's a uh, good business to be able to have all the affordable water that we can get. And in my estimation, the best way to get the most water and the most affordable price is through public water. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Okay, seeing no one else coming forward, I'm gonna close uh, oral communications. Moving on to the consent calendar. Do any of the directors wish to pull any item from consent? I'd like to comment on a couple items, if I could. At what point does that happen? Um, Those items should be pulled. Okay, if you're gonna comment on them, then uh, I suggest you pull them. I'd like to pull item two, the committee assignments. Uh, that's basically it. Okay, anyone else wishing to pull any items? Item three. Okay. Any other directors? 
Any members of the public? Thank you. Sir. Thank you. So we have a motion by Director Potter and a second by Director Byrne. Any, any discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The balance of consent um, passes unanimously. Uh, Director Riley, uh, item two. Um, I would um, I'd like to just call attention to one particular committee, the Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, I know it's been active in the past. It has been relatively inactive in the recent past. And I would like at some point to have uh, the board discuss resurrecting that policy committee, maybe giving it some new direction or different direction or something or other. But um, I feel like part of the concerns I have is that Measure J or Rule 19.8 uh, puts a new responsibility on this board and I would like to see some of that new responsibility incorporated into the committee assignments. I don't know exactly how that plays out but I would like to have some discussion about how that might play out and what the, what committees might play a certain role or a larger role than others and I'd just like to have some discussion about that maybe at a future agenda as well as the, the policy advisory committee <coughs> maybe getting some structure. And that's all. And th through the chair, Madam Chair, I'd actually support that concept. I think that bears a subsequent discussion. Good idea, George. Thank you. Well, I'd like to make a motion to approve the um, committee assignments with the um, caveat that we um, that we re look at the policy committee. Second. Okay, we have a motion, Director Byrne, and a second, Director Potter. Any further discussion on uh, item number two? Um, I do. Um, George, what you're just basically saying is that you don't object to the structure as it's laid out here. Is that, my, is that correct? No, it's not the structure. It's the um, uh, range of interest in the different committees. I'd just like to see the new rule, which is a huge challenge to the district, somehow folded into the various committee assignments. That's all. And, and I just, it just should be discussed, I think. Do you want that in the committee assignments or the committee charge? Discussion. Committee charge, I suppose. Okay. Okay. And Madam Chair, we can look at that just for a little bit of edification. You see how these are labeled uh, board committees and outside uh, agencies liaisons. So the policy advisory committee had previously been, uh, we had two. We have a technical advisory committee and a policy advisory committee. The technical advisory committee is typically representatives from the six cities, the county, and the airport district uh, staff level to look at things like ordinances and what have you. And the policy advisory committee was typically the mayors or a designee of the mayors from city council when there were far-ranging policy objectives of the district that might have an impact on the various jurisdictions. Um, with the formation of the mayor's water authority, if you will, um, we kind of substituted that. So as you remember, our joint meeting just a little over a year ago was with the mayor's authority. We wouldn't have been able to call that meeting of the policy advisory committee because they're all on the mayor's authority. So it, until we see the final resolution of what happens with the mayor's authority, that would probably be who we would go to for those high level uh, discussions. But if we're looking at just uh, defining policy objectives at maybe the, a little higher level, I could see where we <coughs> change the charge and, and focus a little bit more on broader policy issues. Well, I think <coughs> we do that. also the motion would include yeah, we have to come back, um, for <coughs> some of the issues of the um, oh, sorry, it would incorporate some of the issues with the uh, feasibility and our new ordinance. But rule. Madam Chair, this is not the time or place for that discussion. This needs to come back as the motion did call for. Could I suggest that you look toward agendizing this for next month and we can really put some time and some teeth into it? Okay, so. There is a motion and a second. So there is a motion and a second. And so I. <coughs> we just a do clarification we need on what the motion is. Uh, the motion is to essentially reevaluate the. Um, policy committee um, and take a look at, at where that might fit into the overall 
committee assignments. But in the meantime, approve the committee. But in the meantime, yeah, approve yeah, the yeah, committee yeah, assignments. Yeah, okay, yeah, I think yeah, that was the question. The motion was to approve yeah. the, the, committee, was to approve the, the committee, committee assignments and go back. Of that consideration. And, okay. All right. So um, I will open it up to public comment. Mr. Rowley. Uh, good evening again. Tom Rowley representing MPTA. Our organization strongly supported the joint meeting that the Water Management District had with the Monterey Peninsula, the directors of Monterey Peninsula uh, Regional Water Authority, or sometimes known as the Mayor's Group. Unfortunately, still no participation from the Board of Supervisors. Anyway, um, and I think we're disapp very disappointed as an organization that the mayors have had to go it all alone on the Water Authority. By the way, the election, I believe, of the officers for the uh, Water Authority will be at 4 o'clock tomorrow. Their uh, second meeting day is the, the fourth uh, Thursday, and which is tomorrow at Monterey City Hall. That's at four o'clock. So there was a, so it's been agendized, and it is is available. It's open to the public. So I believe that's. I, mean, I think Mr. Potter, as a mayor, will be there. But um, uh, just a I point of clarification, Madam Chair, I show that as next Thursday at six o'clock at the Council Chambers of Monterey. Next Thursday. Um, it shows up on one agenda, so maybe this could be clarified. So, well, but regardless, I'm uh, I'm going to city council meeting, so I won't be there. Yep. Okay. That is so the 31st. That is correct. The, what was it? Uh, I received in an agenda from the city of Monterey a list of meetings, and it had four o'clock tomorrow for the water authority. I think that was because not all could be in attendance that they could okay. move. So it's been delayed till the 31st. I, I believe so, according okay. to my calendar. Good information. Thank you. I'm fallible. Saves going to four, showing up at four o'clock. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Does anybody have any other public comment on the item of committee assignments? Ms. Lehman. Yes, Judy Lehman. Um, I have the information as the 31st as well for the uh -huh. Water Authority, so it's got to be right. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've always worked well together. Too. The, the question I have is, is there a public list of all of the uh, committee appointments? It wasn't discussed here. I know you make them. Um, I'm sure that there are you know, confirmed and, and things like that. Is, will it show up on your website or someplace? Because I know the governance committee is also an important one that needs to be looked at, and that might be something that will interact. So, Very well, um, Arlene, do the do the committee appointments um, are they listed on the website? Yes, they are. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Ms. Lehman. Any other public comment? Okay, we'll close public comment. We have a motion to accept the committee assignments as presented, but to revisit the charter th of each committee in the future. Is that correct? And that had a, that was a specifically the, the uh, specifically the policy advisory commission committee, and that was a motion by Director Byrne, I believe, and seconded by Director Potter, or the other yes, way around. Yes, yes. No, that was correct. Okay. So, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Motion carries. Um, item number three, Director Edwards. Yes. Um, we're about to hire a consultant. Has this consultant ever worked with us before? Yes, in a similar capacity on this particular uh, financing. Okay, another question. Is this consultant going to be used for the feasibility study? If we engage him for the um, securitization on the desal plant, which we'll talk more about if you'd like to, um, then we can have them check the work of the other folks who will be recommended for being hired uh, for the feasibility study. Okay, just transparency, that's why I asked yeah. you that, so people won't think we're hiring folks behind their back and for so something and they're doing something else. Right. So, thank you. I move for approval. If I could, if I could uh, yeah. ask a question as well. Yes. Um, so on the, since you opened it up, on yeah. the uh, payments, um, could you explain how, because it seems to be they'll work if certain things happen, but they won't until certain things happen. Uh, right. So the traditional relationship between a public agency and a bond underwriter or investment banker is uh, all compensation occurs when the bonds are sold. That's very typical. And, and in this agreement, you'll see a, a spot that says, if and when the bonds are sold, it's uh, different dollar values per thousand depending on the credit rating. What we discovered early on when we proposed this structure, um, probably in 2013, 
is that the Public Utilities Commission, we needed testimony filed, we needed modeling done, and there was no hope in sight of an actual financing taking place. So we crafted an agreement with the firm who we had hired to do the underwriting to do expert testimony and filings and so forth, structured very similar to this one. And as it turns out, that work was done in 2013 and a little bit more work leading up to the approval of Pure Water Monterey. And here we are in 2019. And so we recognize that there are potential timing issues, but we need the quality of work and we need the commitment. So we've kind of cobbled together a, a little bit up front for work that we need now and then eventually underwriter-like compensation if and when the bonds get done. And the concern here is um, about a week and a half ago, I believe, maybe two weeks ago, Calam was required to file an advice letter, uh, advice letter 1220 which restated certain sections of the July 2013 settlement agreement among the parties, one of the sections of which was the finance plan for how to get this thing done. Um, you saw in the staff note there were some other nice things that the Public Utilities Commission said about proceeding with the securitization. Um, but we don't know where, you know, we've, we've talked about lawsuits and everything else. But that filing was done. It restated that the finance plan, actually there's a little change in uh, what we call, used to call surcharge two, which there'll be less dollars produced from, uh, basically from cash, from a rate surcharge during construction. Uh, but the securitization, this, uh, what we call rate payer relief bonds, is still part of it. And in order to move forward, we're, we're gonna have to get a motion for a financing order we have to get the underwriter tasked with talking with the rating agencies to get a shadow rating because one of the criteria in both the restated advice letter and the, or the restated settlement agreement is there's no impact on the American Water credit rating and that it's a uh, credit worthy credit. So we actually have to do some of this work recognizing that with the litigious folks that we have there could be an injunction and we could be delayed yet another two to three years. So. It's, again, trying to do the same thing, get quality work up front to qualify it, and if it does, doesn't move forward, then at least we got it done. And so Bond Council, who's worked with us on a variety of reasons, has been there for us kind of all along and is still on an open contract. Um, the investment bankers have kind of come in and out of the process. We need to bring them back in. Okay, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none. Second. Uh, we had a motion from Director Edwards. We did have a second. I don't recall. George. Director Riley seconded. Okay. So, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Move on to the general manager's report. Thank you. <clears throat> a couple of announcements first. Um, for those of you out in our public who might be looking to get a water permit for a project, we will not be issuing any water permits February 1st through February 8th as we convert our database over. Um, so that's just a procedural thing uh, based on the computer. And the second is I just want to inform you that uh, a number of the pieces of work that we're doing, the Los Padres Dam alternative study, the drought contingency plan, and the basin study are likely to have further delays <coughs> for a longer than, uh, period than expected due to the federal government shutdown. Um, all of these are being done interactively with either the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, the U.S. Geological Service, and others, and they will, when they do come back to work, are going to have a backlog of work on top of their normal duties. So. Um, and we've got documents that have to be reviewed by fish scientists from the National Marine Fishes, Fishing Service and others that we're just, we're up against the same wall. Um, so those are the announcements. <coughs> this is the compliance report with respect to the uh, state order and the Seaside Basin decision. Uh, just a very few things to talk about. So this represents the first quarter of the water year. Um, we're three months into it. And <coughs> this is actual versus target production. So every quarter when you approve a quarterly water budget, that in effect controls what we're looking at as a target. And I guess it, it's good to know that we are uh, under our target 
in both uh, pumping in the coastal area and off the river. Um, on the river, we're in a little bit over where we were last year, so the 1,440 versus the 1,352, but we're more than well under on the pumping in the coastal uh, sub area of the seaside groundwater basin. So all the way to the right-hand column, the gray, you can see that we're 114 acre feet better than at the same time last year. And neither last year's numbers nor this year's numbers include any diversions to aquifer storage and recovery, which started in January. On the, <coughs> excuse me, on the other projects and rights, as you see, nothing from uh, aquifer storage and recovery, um, nothing from table 13, although that could change with a backward look uh, mo most likely for the January number. And then Sand City continues to lag behind its expectations to uh, the issues that we've discussed in the past over the, the wells and the, the discharge. This is our proxy for customer service. Um, we're looking fine after only three months. Uh, we're 126 acre feet below the same time last year. So uh, everything's kind of tracking. You may remember the first three months of last year had a little extra demand in the system that we attributed both to the fires and the lack of snow in Tahoe. Um, perhaps our lack of fires in other tourist regions and actual snow in Tahoe reversed that. On this one. And we're nowhere close to our rationing trigger based on uh, the moving average of production. Do you want to talk a little bit about rain? So through the end of December, we had uh, 6.07 inches, which was 90% of the long-term average. If you do read the reports in the back, page 255 and page 257 have incorrect numbers there. Both should reflect the 6.07. It was shown correctly on page 259. Um, but looking at the next chart, this is the rain gauge, the San Clemente rain gauge, and you can see there's a lot of blue bar activity in January. Um, so as I said, at the end of December, we were at 90% of a long-term average, but we've already doubled ourselves. We had, si to, to date, 6.79 inches in January. So we're about uh, two and a half inches over the long-term average. So what you'll see next month will show that we're very likely over 100% of long-term average at this point, which is a good thing. Unimpaired flow, um, you know, again, January is going to look a lot different. There was a lot of unimpaired flow in the Carmel River. Um, but through the end of December, we were at 67% of long-term average. But storage was at 99%, basically full, full storage. <coughs> On aquifer storage and recovery injection, as I mentioned, it started in January. We didn't meet the different water rights criteria until January. Um, we're at 165 acre feet, um, but we're not at the maximum that we could be injecting. Um, as you know, the Hillby pump station and the Monterey pipeline are new. Um, so they're kind of experimenting with how best to operate the system. Previously, it was all fed over the hill at the crest tank up at the top of Tehama and Montero, and then gravity fed down the hill. Um, so we're not maximizing the amount of injection that could be done as both our, our guys and Cal Am's guys still kind of tweak the system, make sure that uh, we can start moving up to, you know, beyond, uh, I guess, beyond 20. Uh, so very, very much the top of the chart on a daily injection basis. We should be able to get there. So that concludes my compliance report. Item 11 is the update on water, uh, water supply projects. I'll try to be brief on this one as well. There's a big agenda. <coughs> Just a reminder that it's a water supply portfolio and we're working on the top green box and the right reddish box uh, as the big additions to the system. And then obviously uh, we've got some work that some of you may have seen out of aquifer storage and recovery. Just a reminder that supply has to equal demand. This is how everything was sized uh, originally based with the application going in in uh, 2012. And it is in effect what was approved. Uh, on the very right-hand column at the bottom, the 6,252 acre feet, that is a 6.4 million gallon per day desal plant. 
So this is a little challenging to read, but this Gantt chart <coughs> is uh, time progress on the Pure Water Monterey. The little uh, vertical line, it's kind of greenish, uh, right under 2019 is where we were in the middle of last week. So you can see we're nearing completion on quite a number of the projects. Um, the blue area is the advanced water purification facility. There is expected testing, 14-day uh, water quality performance testing in June, followed by acceptance testing in July and early August. What we have uh, with the schedule under the water purchase agreement, we have a performance start date of January 1st, 2020. That's when we have to deliver water for CalAMS use for delivery to customers. And, no, uh, and that can be no later than six months after what's called the delivery start date. Well, what you're seeing here in this calendar is the delivery start date will probably be closer to five months before the required delivery date to Cal-Am. And we have to produce an operating reserve that the district will be funding of about 1,000 acre feet. And 1,000 acre feet is going to take about three to three and a half to four months to fill. So we're going to be right up against the window of deliveries to the operating reserve and then deliveries to Calum. Uh, the other thing I should point out is um, on the source water, the weather, uh, rain and site access have limited uh, the Blanca drain pump station and the reclamation ditch pump station a little bit. But uh, the final completion date for the Blanca drain is going to slip a little bit or has slipped a little <coughs> bit due to uh, some foundation support peer issues, but they've been rectified. And then also there was a pretty significant series of uh, change orders on that, on the source water, uh, going from overhead electrical to undergrounding, um, modification of the pump storage, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, pump station, and some adjustments to, to the four main. Uh, so that's, that was about 173,000 of change orders. But progress is really great at the advanced water purification facility. There's a bunch of floor slabs that have been poured and the uh, building on the membrane building is uh, being erected and the MFRO and ultraviolet uh, facilities have uh, been installed with piping. So you really, it's, it's starting to look, you can envision it, I guess, at this point. Um, the water conveyance to the injection wells have pretty much all been completed except the tying in of the wells. And then the project that we're managing is the uh, injection facilities and uh, they were working on development of the second uh, deep injection well last week. A lot of water was in the uh, backflush basin as you develop the well. And uh, the replacement, uh, the Vado zone well uh, will be done after that second injection well is finished. On a funding side, on the expenditure side, you can see that we're less than halfway. So the second column of numbers says uh, about $54 million was to go out in the current fiscal year. We're halfway through the fiscal year and only 22 million has gone out. So we'll expect a flurry of activities from now until July. And on funding and reimbursements, this is just a reminder of where the money came from. Um, our out-of-pocket was all during the pre-construction phase, that 12 million two number. Um, the other thing that needs to be pointed out is FORA, I believe, has approved a grant for this project, a piece of a grant for this project that's not reflected on here. And also, if you look at the state revolving fund, the SRF loan line, you can see that the amount billed is about, well, the amount received is about two-thirds of the amount billed, and that just underscores the slowness of the state to get money back to us, um, which is why you need credit lines and things like that. On the desal side, uh, there hasn't been much activity, and it's only been reported through the third quarter of uh, last year. The fourth quarter report's not out yet. But here is, in effect, um, what the component pieces cost and what's been expended to date. So, you know, it's $117 million expended to date on a $337 million project. So <coughs> you take the $8 million out, that makes it a, a $329 million project overall project to complete, and that's a number that you can see out there in public quite a bit, 329. The milestones, we've made it through the 2018, so the next milestone, I alluded to this earlier, is starting of construction of the desal plant by September 30th. So 
that's the next big one to look out for. That's why this lawsuit that was filed last Wednesday, um, if it were to result in an injunction, could result in missing a milestone with an unknown uh, outcome, whether we would So each of these milestones, if missed, would cause a 1,000 acre foot reduction in the diversion limit from the river, how much water you can take from the river. If it was caused by actions outside of the control of the district, the mayor's authority, or California American Water, then the executive director of the state board has the option to uh, void or rescind the reduction. As impatient as they are with us, there's no guarantee they would do that. So it remains a risk of a 1,000 acre foot uh, reduction in what can be taken from the river if we miss that milestone. Yep. And then over on ASR. Where I'm from. So the first picture shows what the backflush pit looked like. It's a little hard to see, but you can see two uh, outfall pipes. And then they're basically in the same position in the second picture. And we've had a, a very significant expansion, uh, which will now be able to serve all of the facilities up in that range uh, off of General Jim Moore Boulevard. And then this is a foundation being poured for a uh, cinder block and iron wall for the gate, which will have a nice presence for the, the district in the name of the facility and uh, will begin to establish a little bit greater security for the site as well. So that's moving along. And then finally, Malpaso. For those of you who have kind of gone through this before, Malpaso assigns water to a parcel. That's the sale of the Malpaso right. But that doesn't mean anything to us at the district unless that parcel owner comes in and he can kind of just signal that he's got that right by get, getting issued a water use permit. And then when they're ready to build, they come in for the actual water permit. So what you see on the assignment side is they're done. They had 80 acre feet to sell and they've sold 79.9. So <coughs> that idea that I think, uh, I was a little skeptical that they would get there this fast, uh, they got there. But on a water use permit side, just acknowledging the, the entitlement, uh, it's only about half of the total. And then the actual building projects that have come through is only 11 acre feet, uh, you know, about 107. So those are little tenths of an acre foot home expansion. Stuff like that. Do you know how much they were selling the water for? Two hundred and forty thousand dollars per acre foot. Right. So if you needed a tenth of an acre foot, twenty four grand. Did I do that math right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then finally the local water projects. Uh, this is relatively unchanged other than to say the city of Monterey uh, stormwater uh, resource management study is moving along and uh, we're going to need to work with the city of Pacific Grove to look a little harder at the summer water use for the golf course and cemetery to ensure that the, that they're entitled to their full entitlement. So we'll be doing that in the, these coming months. And that, that concludes the project. Uh, we're not really looking at these. These are just placeholders. <coughs> Thank you. Yep. Chair, just a couple of questions to the general manager. Mm -hmm. Are we using that, that new pipeline that just was put in for ASR? Yes. Um, so the Hillby pump station is basically, let's call it the end of that pipeline going south to north. And that's just down the hill from General Jim Moore, and it pushes water up the hill to aquifer storage and recovery. And through December, the electronic controls, SCADA controls, had not yet been fully functional. Um, but now we are in January, and I think, Chris, you're out there, it's, it's functioning now electronically. And so um, we'll be using that pipeline and the existing pipeline up over the hill from, you know, Carmel Valley Greens to. Uh, Montera, um, and they'll, they'll be working at trying to find the optimal mix of those two. But the, yeah, we're using that Monterey pipeline. Okay, just a, one comment. I hope we use it to the max so we know how good that pipeline is. You know, keeping it low 
and we got these flows going now, let's crank it up. Crank it up so we can see if it's going to break, leak, or, or, or it's great. So I hope we can do that earlier than later. Uh, my next question, Pure Water Monterey. I, I got an email about the grand opening. Is that phase one, probably in August, that we're looking at? We're going to celebrate Pure Water Monterey probably six times before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're looking for a date for the operational grand opening. So okay. yeah, that's the timeline. And that's all I got. Thank you. Okay, any other directors have questions on the general manager? If I could, um, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, Dave, I don't think that the public realizes that um, the differentiation you're making between when the water is injected and the, the lag time that's required by um, it's public health before you can extract it. Um, there is a, has it been established the number of months Yet in the permit? For Pure Water Monterey, yes. yes. Uh, it's a six month uh, residency time. Based on modeling, uh, you could pretty much extract from a production well immediately because it's longer than a six month travel time to actually meet the, or to reach one of the extraction wells. So, technically speaking, the molecules we'd be pulling out the same day would meet water accounting and meet water quality issues because there's no way it could get there within six months. But um, we have to do tracer tests, um, some other things that haven't been done yet. So. Okay. Uh, moving on to the uh, number 12, the update on major district projects. Uh, that's just uh, included in the packet. Oh, so I apologize. Thank you. And we are working at expanding that to um, all district contracts over 25000 Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then, so then we'll move on to number 13, the attorney's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, members of the board and the public. Uh, tonight's report will be on two meetings. On December 17th, uh, the board did meet in closed session. The first half of that closed session from 5 to 7 was, was reported upon during that meeting. That report is found in your draft minutes at page four of your board packet. But the board's review of those matters did not uh, conclude at that time. The board did adjourn its uh, regular meeting at 9 p.m. and did reconvene in closed session for a further one half hour discussion of the closed session items. But no reportable action was taken at that time. I just wanted to clarify the events of that day. Earlier this evening, uh, <coughs> at 6.30, the board did meet in closed session to consider one item, and it was the uh, petition that was filed by the City of Marina that uh, Mr. Stolt flashed on uh, the cover page of on the screen earlier. Uh, at the uh, board did receive a report as to the status of that action, and in fact uh, did authorize staff and council uh, to file an answer to the uh, petition of the City of Marina for writ of review. Uh, that was on motion of Director Byrne, second of Director Edwards, and it was a unanimous 7 to 0 vote authorizing that action. That concludes my report. Thank you. Okay, uh, number 14 oral reports on any director's uh, activities at city, uh, county, or other agencies. Director Hoffman. Yes, I just wanted to report on, actually I had three meetings since our last meeting. Um, I met with the general manager of uh, Monterey One Water, actually, and got a briefing on Pure Water Monterey, which was very informative and just excellent and provided me with a great understanding of what they're doing out there. And I got to see the facility being built. And as Dave pointed out, um, the buildings being put up, the, all the filters, they've already been delivered. They're just now... Uh, basically putting it together. Um, they actually have a demonstration project that they have out there. You can go actually go out and visit and see what the process is and actually drink some of the water um, they have uh, if, you, if you dare. Um, but um, so after that meeting it occurred to me that 
we should invite um, Paul, the general manager, to make a brief um, presentation about uh, Pure Water Monterey to the board and to the public, <coughs> because in my discussions with members of the public, it, it appears that they just they don't have a full understanding of the source waters and actually what's um, going to be the ultimate result of, of that project. And I think just be very informative. So I would just suggest that we um, invite Paul to do that. Um, I also met with um, uh, Michael Waxer of the Kama River Watershed Conservancy. And I wanted to bring this up because they've taken the effort to do a pharmaceutical drug um, diversion project, keeping pharmaceuticals from getting into um, the waste stream and then ultimately into the Carmel River or into uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So um, I've actually printed out and I'll pass around to the board members and we can make it available to the public. Um, there are several sites around the area where you can drop off unused pharmaceuticals as opposed to flushing them down the toilet, uh, for example. And um, I think um, that we should um, support the efforts of the, of the, of the um, conservancy in this effort, um, if not making our offices um, a location for drop off. I understand that might be difficult because if you'll, yeah, if you'll notice, some of the places that they list are the police departments because some of them are um, drugs that are um, Schedule One or whatever the terminology is for them, which um, you can't have to be handled specially. Um, so um, I, I brought this, and if there's some way that we can support their efforts, I think we should look into it. Um, the third meeting I had is actually I met with um, Chris um, and actually got to see the pipeline and went to the pump station and on the first day actually it turns out that it was um, started operating in the test run um, injecting into the ASR uh, wells so um, uh, that was a very helpful and I appreciated um, uh, Chris uh, taking me around as well as Catherine um, and um, <coughs> So those, again, if anybody gets a chance to go out there, you can see the ASR wells from General Jim Moore. Um, and if you're driving in the area, I suggest you, you take a look. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Any other directors? Uh, I will say that I did uh, have the opportunity to speak to the Monterey uh, Commercial Property Owners Association. Uh, and also the new Monterey Neighborhood Association um, this past month, uh, just about a lot of the what was going on in the listening sessions and other uh, items that the district is working on. All right, with that, we'll move on to item 15 to receive a report on Rule 19.8 listening sessions of the January 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 15th, um, and to determine subsequent action regarding preparation of a feasibility study. Uh, before we get into this, I just want to state um, and I, I assume that I'm speaking for the whole board when I say this, but thank you, Arlene, for all of the hard work that you put in and getting those uh, listening sessions and everything that you did there from um, distributing and collecting the ranking sheets, getting the room set up, uh, working the um, timer, and all, all of the other pieces, parts that you did. Uh, you did them so beautifully. The sessions ran really, really well, and I just want to thank you for all of your efforts on that. <coughs> So I, I prepared a fairly lengthy staff note that begins at page 79, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, yes, we had, uh, it was a great eight days, I, I would say, I think. Um, <laughs> it was arduous, and, uh, but, but the directors rose to the occasion, our public rose to the occasion. Um, so basically, these are the dates and lo locations where we were. Many of you know we were there because you were there. Um, yeah, we did ranking sheets, but we also took uh, a lot of public comment. We wrote everything down that um, could be written down that might be relevant to our tasks. And uh, uh, it was, I think there were very, very good events. 
Um, the general topic of the, the each evening was, you know, what does feasible mean to you? Which measure of feasibility is most important to you? Uh, what did you perceive to be the public benefits? Um, <coughs> that goes a little bit hand in hand with per perhaps future next stages of this process. Um, here it is by the numbers. Uh, the attendees, you know, I guess this was the smallest. As you said, it's the Rorschach test uh, division you know, covering uh, pieces of different uh, jurisdictions. So it was the smallest one attended at 55, which is still very large attendance. And then uh, Carmel wrapped it up the biggest for last, uh, 105, and it really could have been 110 um, or more. Uh, you know, we kind of based all of these by counting the number of seats and counting the number of open seats and counting the standees, but these are pretty accurate numbers. So that's, that's a really good uh, turnout. And we know some of the folks attending were the same people, just kind of uh, attending everyone. The speakers, uh, it, this shows us something. It shows that a lot of people came to listen and learn and not everybody wanted to be heard. So uh, we really appreciate that if that was your motivation as well. Uh, the ranking sheets return, there's two numbers in each box. The top one are the feasibility sheet numbers. The bottom are the uh, uh, public benefit or desirability. And I have to tell you, there were more than these returned, but these are only what we call the responsive ones. If you put a one in every one of the items, unfortunately, you got kicked out. Um, not everything can be most important to you, and we had several of those. Um, and if you only ranked one and left six others blank or five others blank, uh, not quite there. But there was a lot of latitude in between. And there were some more sheets returned just uh, today and uh, yesterday and more comment letters. So in your uh, packet tonight, um, there are at least three or four new comment letters that came in. Uh, then we also looked at the ranking sheet comments, and there were quite a number of those as well. This is where people got down into the other section and wrote something down. And then we took all of the spoken comments, the written comments, and the correspondence, and we looked for common themes or <laughs> common statements. And those were summarized in the staff note. And this last row, I think, really speaks to your commitment as directors. We had five or six directors at every one of these. And um, you didn't have to do that. I mean, we had the division director moderate but everyone, I think, uh, you really showed that you wanted to listen to the district's constituents across the board, not just the ones closest to home. Then we, did, we had a little bit of a presentation, um, the feasibility analysis being just the first part. If it does prove to be feasible on an um, objective measure that you will be talking about it uh, in the near term. Then you go to a bench trial for establishing the right to take. Um, this happens after a resolution of public necessity and a condemnation filing, um, which you would likely do if you have an unwilling seller. And then if you do have the right to take, the, the judge determines that you do, you go to a jury trial for valuation. We also talked about the process and the types of consultants you'll need, and we're in the midst of uh, requesting uh, qualifications from these various different consultants thinking that the cost of service modeler and the valuation specialist are going to be the most expensive um, but can be the same entity. Then we also talked to the public about the difference between feasibility, doability, and desirability. And really, the ranking sheets went to feasibility and desirability. And desirability is really setting the stage for if you do get to the bench trial, what are the benefits, public benefits of uh, public ownership. The ranking sheets, okay, <coughs> you know, I'll admit it, I found it fascinating. Um, in feasibility, the, you know, the, the rankings were supposed to be one as most important, six being least important, and everything came up between three and 4.3. Desirability is supposed to be one most important, seven least important, came up between 3.4 and 4.5. So what happened is everybody who felt really strongly about something basically had another person who felt that that was the least important thing and felt strongly about somewhere else on the spectrum. And then the middle issues, everyone kind of overlapped. And so we canceled each other out. Com community, um, that's, that kind of sums up Monterey Peninsula anyway. <laughs> <so>. <laughs>
On the standards of financial feasibility, um, if this does work, yeah. So I want to point out a couple of interesting outcomes here. So in Division One, the most important. So this is. So instead of averages, I went to okay. Which one had the most number ones? Which one had the most number twos? And which one had the most number sevens? So the most number ones, immediate savings. The most <coughs> number sevens, immediate <coughs> savings. I don't care if there's savings till the debt's paid off is second most important and tied for least important. Immediate savings, second most important, and <coughs> least important. So even in the, you know, the ordinal rankings of the thing, it kind of bore out what was happening with the averages. Same thing on the standards of desirability. Another good example here is lower cost was the most important in Pacific Grove and tied for the least important. The other tied for least important is also the second most important. And again, Division 5, 105 people in Carmel, most important, least important. So, in effect, <coughs> we have a split community as to what we think is most important. <coughs> However, having poured through all the comments and listened as we did, I think we learned a lot about what the extremes are as well as some of the areas that may not matter so much. We also heard some things about um, I don't want any of this to appear separately on a tax bill. I want it to be all in the rates. And so there's some other common themes that came out of this. So I think as we move forward, you know, the recommendation for you tonight is to just simply receive the report, uh, direct us to have uh, consultant recommended, consultants recommended for hiring at the next board meeting, and to conduct um, discussion over what you want to adopt as measures of feasibility at the February board meeting so that we can instruct the consultants to test their assumptions against those measures. So that's where we stand. Okay. Do any of the directors have any questions of our general manager? Um, I have some comments. Not yeah, questions. No questions? Okay. Do anybody have any questions? I have some questions on the consultancy uh, element. I don't know if you want to do that now or if you want to stay with the feasibility. Uh, right now, the uh, agendized item is to receive the report on the listening sessions. Okay. All right. I'll wait. Okay. Thank you. Any directors? Any other directors I'd, with I'd, questions? I do, please. Um, well, Dave, I'm going to uh, challenge some of your... Is, are these questions? No. Okay. Then I'm, I'm just I'm going for questions. I'm sorry. The questions of staff. Sorry. All right, and then I would like to open it up for public comment on the results of the listening session. Good, good evening. My name's Bill Hood, and I thought I was at, attended the, the, the Carmel presentation, and I thought your general manager did an excellent job of making that because you're dealing with people who generally have no, in, no idea about how complicated doing a feasibility study is or, and water you know, issues in themselves are very complicated. But in spite of the, the good job he did, I think these ranking uh, schedules, or whatever you want to call them, I think were not a good idea. And here's why. <coughs> a lot of people who don't know really very much about it, yeah, I want lower costs. Yes, I want them immediate. They don't really understand the complications that are involved in even getting there. And you might be giving people ideas of that, yes, that's what you're going to be able to to complete for us when it's all over, when in fact any kind of study that's worth its, its uh, penny is, is done by looking, you have the expertise which you're going to get, uh, looking at facts. You're not looking at what desirabilities are, you're looking at facts and it's going to come out one way or the other <coughs> and it may or may not make people very pleased to see that the end process will not end up exactly what they think they may get. So I th that's the one flaw that I saw in the whole thing, but I mean, overall, I think it was a really good presentation. Thank you, Mr. Hood. Hi. 
Uh, my name is Renee Franken. I'm from Monterey, and I also wanted to comment on the report. Um, I was actually very impressed with the report the general manager gave at the listening sessions um, and the opportunity that the board gave all of us to come and give comments. And if I had been sitting in his, his shoes, um, I probably would have tried to provide some notion of what feasibility might mean to different people and see what, what kind of reaction I got. And I thought about it. I went to uh, the Seaside meeting, and I didn't comment at the time uh, because I was really trying to sort of take in what both people were saying and also the list of definitions, possible definitions of feasibility. And I thought about that over the last week or so, and I came to the conclusion that, you know, in a way, this is just, what, what, what do we have, about 200 people or so who came ultimately to the various sessions and spoke. Uh, everyone has a different opinion. They're grouped. I mean, I thought it was really interesting to see how things ranked high and low in, in uh, you know, the same items. Um, what I'm trying to get at is we don't know what was in the mind of the voters with respect to a definition of feasibility, but what we do know is that over 55 percent of the voters supported Measure J. And my feeling is that one of the ways we might approach this is to look at feasibility in terms of how can we make this work? Because that is what the voters have, have told us. They may have had different reasons. In fact, it's obvious they had different reasons. But I think the ultimate thing is that what the vote tells us is public water is what the voters voted for. And I think if we also think about the fact that it's pretty hard to get something like that passed in the first place, um, I really think that's a pretty resounding statement. And I think if we can approach it from that standpoint, let's see how we can make that work, we'd be better off. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Franken. Hi. My name is Anna Thompson. I live in Carmel. And um, the feasibility study that I have in mind uh, asks for two things. Uh, one is the cost estimates, and then the other side is the benefits that we're going to get. And that would mean all the benefits. Re uh, some would be more valuable than others, but all together make up the reason why we want to purchase or not purchase it if there are no benefits. Uh, so that's my uh, comment on this. Um, the, uh, and we, we wanted to be able to do the same for the alternative, which is keeping cow land. What are the costs in keeping cow land? And what are the benefits that we're going to get by having private ownership versus that we're not going to get? because we have public ownership. So those are very critical conditions, in my opinion, to make it something be it feasible or not feasible. Also, there is a time frame that needs to be considered. <coughs> the immediate uh, costs might not, might not be any less than they will be if we uh, maintain the, the uh, private uh, ownership. But if you look at it for the span of time, then you're going to see the longer time it is, the more the benefits are, the less expensive it's going to be, and the public ownership is to our best interest overall. Okay, that's, that's one comment I have. The opposite is true for Calam. The longer the time, the higher the costs will be. So it's not a good investment for the long run. <coughs> um, during my uh, excuse me, Ms. Thompson, yes. um, in this public comment, it is on the item which is the report out of the feasibility oh my God, sessions. Again, I, I screwed up. <laughs> I am not asking for your comment on the feasibility well, study. I, I, I it, the comment uh, is on his report out and well, the results and of his report. In a way, it's the same thing because the report shows that the, the interest is based on specific things when they're being ranked. I wanted to say that the report should be basing it on all the benefits and not just what, which one is the most desirable. 
And uh, so I thought that I was responding to that, but I could come back if you don't mind. If you tell me when, I will be able to, to speak. And I wanted to, to give you the other reasons okay. why I think that, that we, we need to move forward on public. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, Madam Chair and Board Members, um, um, Mary Ann Carbone with the City of San City, and um, I may be, may be, <laughs> this may might not be the right moment, but as you move forward with your implementation of, implementation of Measure J, the City Council of San City requests that you take the following actions. I don't know, Chair, if it's okay to read this or not at this time. I think there's no other time to read it. <laughs> um. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, number one, uh, that all factual data that the board plans to use when undertaking the feasibility study be publicly listed. Number two, the board publicly articulate their definition and boundaries for the determination of feasibility before data uh, collection takes place and which CALAM water assets are being considered for condemnation. Three, every effort be made by the board to make all of their decisions, deliberations, directions to consultants, consultant scope of works, et cetera, transparent and available to the public. The board should not hide behind the potential threat of litigation to discuss in closed session items that they would rather not discuss in the open session. The feasibility component, that is, the first step in the condemnation process does not involve any negotiations whatsoever. When you get to the bench trial on public necessity, it be open to the court with no secrets. And four, the board should make it clear what the costs and risks are associated with each stage of the process. For example, what is the range of estimated costs for feasibility anal <clears throat> analysts, how much is budgeted to meet those costs, where those dollars come from, and what is the risk associated with the phase of the process, assuming that the board finds acquisition feasible, what are the costs and risks associated going forward with the bench trial necessary to have the court find publicly public necessity which is necessary to actually condemn Calam water assets. Assuming the bench trial is successful, what are the costs and risks associated with going forward with a jury trial to determine the value of Calam water assets? I uh, did give a copy of this to Arlene earlier, and uh, thank you very much. And thank you for everything that you do here on the board. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. David Beach, Monterey. Uh, I hope you've received a hard copy of some slides that were, were passed around, beginning with urgent suggestions on, on the title page. And uh, it, this is uh, addressing very directly the, uh, the part of the agenda item that says determine subsequent action. And uh, the clock's ticking. We, we, we had six months to get to the stage of, of having a written plan, and Dave, the, the, it's now down under five months, as it were. How far are we? Uh, and and so, the um, there is real urgency, and uh, the first point I want to make is that uh, it seems to be the time when the board needs to get heavily involved. So far, all the decisions I believe have been taken uh, by staff. Excuse uh, me, just and, one and second, Mr. Beach. Excuse me, Arlene, yes. is this timer working? Thank you. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, but you can't start over, Mr. Beach. <laughs> right, and so, and so, uh, 
I, I think there were problems with the methodology of, of, the, of the study, as Mr. Hood pointed out. I, I find difficulty even with uh, how bad's the pain on a scale of zero to 10. Uh, and so um, I'm going to concentrate, however, on constructive uh, proposals. I'm going to make three suggestions in, in my three minutes. And the, the urgency is underlined by the fact that I believe at the next board meeting, February the 23rd, you're supposed to be approving uh, selected consultants. And yet, uh, I see no evidence to have any education on, on the process or who they are. I've uh, not seen anything on uh, an open session or a closed session agenda that, that says the board has, has been involved. So my suggestion one is that it's necessary to schedule an extra meeting before that February the 23rd meeting. We can't afford to lose time, and, and the board needs to really get up to speed on the, uh, on the background of the decisions they're expected to be taking February the 23rd. So the two items I suggest for the agenda, one, to, to review the re re request for qualification, uh, job specifications that these consultants received, uh, and, and become familiar with what they are, are being asked to do, and that could, I think, be an, an open session, except so far as the, uh, the Brown Act uh, allows things to be kept secret, and I believe that's a rather narrow definition. And uh, second, um, you need to establish what the process is going to be after that February 23rd meeting. How are the consultants supposed to proceed? Uh, and, and so... Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to make a, a, a definite suggestion on that. Uh, but uh, I believe this next meeting, this extra meeting, uh, should be preferably as con con constructed as a workshop so that, uh, that there is a more free exchange in, in a dialogue uh, and not three minutes uh, and that's it. And, and, and so it, it could perhaps be set up as a, a separate advisory committee, but there needs to be some uh, urgent effort uh, and, and, and with a lot of transparency uh, to make these big decisions as to how we're going to meet this tight schedule. Because uh, as I read the, uh, the, the ballot measure, if, if the general manager fails to deliver uh, the, the, uh, uh, the written plan by that date, uh, the, the, the pr project's dead. <coughs> uh, so the, my se second suggestion is uh, that even though there's a hurry, please avoid premature def decisions. Uh, and, and I, I, I say, cons compare that with Brexit. Uh, and, and you can see that's a major disaster where people were asked to make a, a decision in a state of ignorance. Now that they see what's the best deal, uh, that they might want, and so I'm suggesting that, um, th that in, in this community, uh, you don't ask the consultants, exa for example, to make recommendations or the staff. You, they're fact gatherers. They should present all the facts before the board, and then a decision on feasibility should be should be made by the board. Thank uh, you my very third much. suggestion, if I may, uh, Mr. or Beach? you can just if you can just read it, please, and, and, and if these could be entered into the record. But it, it is that uh, uh, it's some some constructive ideas on, on how to focus on that document and get it done in time. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Baer, Carmel Valley. I attended the uh, first and last of the, of the five meetings, and I want to thank the board for their attendance. Those were great numbers. Um, you know, I want to speak briefly to a couple things that Dave presented, but I think also what we're trying to do as a community is where do we go from here, and I think he mentioned that. So I think within the purview of what happened at the listening tour and where do we go from here, this is all pertinent information. Um, but uh, in your presentation, you said there's a valuation jury trial, and I'm just curious, how is it determined what community, I don't think it should be in Monterey County, how is it determined where that jury trial will be held? And uh, just because the survey was a bust doesn't mean there's not wisdom in crowds. To point, I started my speech here before Dave's report with the first sentence, there's a divide in our community over water. The former members of the Mayor's Authority in alliance with the Business Coalition the deep pockets who do billions of dollars of business and who pay millions in taxes to keep our cities beautiful, which everyone benefits from, the ratepayers and the hospitality industry, because the tourists want to come to beauty and we enjoy living here. So that group versus the Measure J advocates. I claimed earlier tonight that Mr. Piner is a pipeline for Cal-Am, even, and even if it's not true, a large majority of the population that has lived here 15 to 20 years will believe it. 
it destroys the credibility of this process because people, if it doesn't come out, you know, people will feel it's been rigged from the start. To mitigate what I said earlier about CalAM having a direct line, and apart from not having any closed sessions, what I suggest is a feasibility public advisory committee that will include the business coalition, that will include <coughs> the public water coalition that passed Measure J by 56%, and will include other interested, let's say, less partisan members of our community who have brains and ideas about how to solve water problems. We need to use that. And it'll be the first opportunity to have a formal setting to decide if there's anything in common between the hospitality industry and the Measure J proponents. What can we get together on? All we do is undermine each other. That's the battle we've been having. So I suggest this advisory committee, let us see the reports, as, you know, the transparency of what's coming from the consultants. Let us hash it out. Let us make advice to you. And you don't have to do anything about it. But maybe we'll have a constructive dialogue for the first time in a long time and heal the divide in this community. Thank you, Mr. Bear. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Barbara Evans. I live in Carmel. I went online and read tonight's agenda and went through about 300 pages of attachments. God help you. I did see my written comments in there. Just a couple of afterthoughts, which may be obvious and already in the plan. Every consultant and each board member checks for their conflict of interest. And there should be a record, a little writing, a box you check that it has been done. Where it cuts both ways, directors and the consultants you're hiring, checking for conflict of interest. Um, number two, I definitely, if I were in your shoes, I would definitely want to see two separate scenarios to help me decide feasibility and desirability. One with DeSal and one without desal, just in case you hadn't considered that. I think that would be help a lot. From comments I heard, desal plant has problems. So I ask, why would you want to buy into a litigious situation with controversy? The proposed desal plant doesn't look like an asset yet. I would like to think we could regroup and do better, working in collaboration and cooperation with our regional neighbors. I know you need to plan for eminent domain litigation. What a shame we have to sue each other to get information. Document production. One can only hope negotiation could be a possibility. And in any event, in any event, you will need strategies for negotiating. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Doug Wilhelm, uh, uh, Carmel. I've spent uh, 34 years with uh, Procter & Gamble, and most of that time I was involved in negotiation, a lot of it in purchasing, but some of it in other areas of the business. And there's one fundamental rule in negotiations, and that is you don't show your cards. So I'm all in favor of as much for as much uh, uh, openness as we possibly can have, but at the same time, we can't lay out on the table, well, here's the maximum amount we can pay, because otherwise, then we're fighting behind our back, because I'm sure you Cal-Am won't be on the, on the same, on the, and saying what the maximum amount, minimum amount that they'll take. Uh, so I just want you to be uh, thinking about that when, you, when we talk about uh, openness. And I'm, uh, I think as we go along, you'll be able to come up with some uh, ideas as to where, uh, where you can not be open as open as saying, well, we really could afford to pay a little bit more for that, or we don't have to count this. Uh, but uh, uh, if we don't do that, then we will fail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilhelm. <coughs> Good evening again. Tom Raleigh representing Monterey Peninsula Taxpayers Association. Uh, five quick points. Um, first is a uh, real big thank you to the directors that participated. Um, I attended the one that was here 
uh, for Division Two because I live in Division Two. I also watched the uh, replay on TV for the one that was held at Monterey City Hall, chaired by uh, Director Evans. I watched actually I watched it twice because there were some really some great comments in that. Um, particularly, I like the one that said uh, by Tom Reeves, former city official with Monterey, said, "Whatever happens, we need to have another vote." But anyway, that's um, the second item is um, conflict of interest was mentioned, and. <coughs> what a lot of voters didn't recognize is that having the water management district be in charge of the study to determine whether the water management district should be to take over the water district is an inherent conflict of interest. And I explained that to some of my neighbors and they said, you know, I never thought about that. When I signed the petition, that wasn't explained to me. And I mentioned the last time I spoke before you that some people were misled about what Measure J when they signed the petition to put it on the ballot, <coughs> some of them were told, it's only a study. Okay, we know it was much more than that. Third, feasibility. And I think Director, um, Executive Director Stolt did a great job of laying out on the feasibility, the cost, and the benefits. Okay, cost, fairly objective. You can come up with some numbers. You can, you know, if it's done honestly, it's straightforward. And our organization will definitely be looking at what the cost data and the different permutations. Um, benefits, that's very subjective. So basically what I've said before really applies. On feasibility, on cost, without a cap on the cost, it is a blank check. Let me say that again. Without a cap on the cost, feasibility without a, blank, without a cap is a blank check. And again, um, the inherent conflict of interest is when you think about it, that's a little bit disturbing. Fourth, the rankings on the survey sheets. Uh, with all due respect to University of Illinois graduate Director Stolt, Executive Director Stolt, um, I was a sociology minor and did a lot of surveying work and studied surveys. And you have to be very careful on your polling and your the way you conduct a survey to draw any hard, hard uh, opinions. You get some opinions, and it was interesting to know, find out the community split, I mean, what's new on that? So the thing is, I wouldn't hang that much on these rankings. They were interesting. Um, the last thing is um, transparency was mentioned by quite a few people at both the, the listening session here and the listening session at Monterey City Hall. It's been mentioned again tonight by a few individuals. And again, negotiations, but the community is hoping for as much transparency as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Dan Turner, Monterey. I'm afraid I'm the guy who walked around Tom's neighborhood and told everybody the wrong stuff. I, I, I told people that we want to get rid of Calam. We really want to get rid of Calam. We want a public agency. And again, went through all the reasons. Uh, I said, but we have to do this stupid study first because it's mandated by a 1992 state law that Calam and its lobbyists got passed through the legislature in 1992. Um, so, I don't know why they don't. But I do have a question about um, the, the surveys. Uh, uh, um, um, General Manager Stolt, you said that you tossed the ones that were all number one. If someone just put number one for everything, they would just toss? What would that have meant? Were the contradictory thing? I don't remember it exactly. Or would that just be something that a, a public water enthusiast, someone who wanted to get rid of Calam, have tended to have done? I, I don't remember the. Uh, may, maybe I could see. Maybe someone has one of these lying about, and I could be given what I just like to. So, Arlene, if there's one of these forms lying about, maybe sometime I could stop in and take a look at it. Okay. You get one and I. Thank you. Can I respond to something Tom said? Oh, you, you didn't? Oh, yeah. I, I apologize, Mr. I, he, d he did speak. He did? He did? Well, Madam Chair, John Origi, Coalition for Financial Businesses. I just want to make sure um, Coalition submitted a letter on January 14th that speaks directly to the subsequent actions regarding 
Dave, I'm assume it got into the director's packets. Is this the one with the specific questions? Yes, yes. There's, uh, there are 15 questions that deals with uh, number 15 item, subsequent action regarding the preparation of a feasibility study. Is yes. Is it, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norigi. Um, I don't see any conflict of interest in MPWMD doing this. Melody Chrislock. The public voted for public water. You're the agency they signed to do it. There's no conflict of interest there. And the public water now volunteers were carefully trained. They were not misleading anyone. That was actually what Calham did by saying it's not just a feasibility study. They implied that we said it was. We never did. We always said it's a buyout if feasible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Krizlock. Ms. Thompson, I'd like you to come up and finish your comments, if you would be willing. I, <coughs> I need to state my name again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I don't see any conflict of interest of what, between the uh, board of directors here and uh, um, the feasibility study, doing the feasibility study, uh, because your job is, as far as the way I understand it, is to do what is best for the community. <coughs> if it turns out that doing best for the community is to keep Calan, that's what you're going to propose. If it is uh, to, to do what is best for the community is through public uh, ownership, then that's what you should pursue. Okay, that's my opinion. All right, there is no um, conflict of interest. Now we're talking about reasons, our benefits, that we want to consider that be critical in my mind. Okay, uh, I just want to give an example. Uh, during my canvassing for Measure J, I asked the reason why the person will be voting yes or no on Measure J. And I need to take a big breath. <laughs> Okay, uh, I was really impressed by one young man's response. He said, I have been receiving so much email for Ka from Carl Ann Lanley, so I began to wonder, why is Carl Ann spending so much time and money to defeat Major J? It must be because it's very profitable to them, for them to want to keep it. So, therefore, my question for you is, why well, we wanted to continue paying all those huge profits when we don't get any benefit from paying those, bene those, those profits because you'll be able to manage and provide all the, the necessary uh, uh, work and the costs will be the same. So why do we want to pay those additional costs? Why don't we want to invest instead in our own system? Okay, that's for the future and it's the, the future generations are going to be very happy with your decision. And it's not just for our own self-interest, but it's for, for the, the whole community interest. Okay, that's, that's a major reason. Another reason that I was given was um, we wanted to have control of the policy-making decisions that uh, the, the, uh, the public utility will be making or the private. And, and the private, their, their interests are conflicting with what the interest of the public is. The interest of the public, of the private ownership <laughs> is profits. And they don't, the more profits they make, the better. So they're going to decide for anything that is most expensive because the more they invest, the more profits they make. So what fools are we? You know, I just, I just wanted to make sure that we understand what are the two key components. Of, of the feasibility study. And uh, this young man uh, did tell me, why wouldn't I want to invest in the, in the system if the column is willing to invest in the system? Thank you. Thank I you, Ms. Tom. I appreciate all your work, by the way. And I really appreciate the fact that you allow me to, to speak my mind. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, seeing nobody else come forward, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, directors, uh, anybody with a comment? George, I believe you said you had a comment earlier. I have a couple, of, a couple of comments. One, um, I think um, Rule 19.8 or Measure J um, was, a, was a demand on the district to do a feasibility study. And the district decided to go out into the public to get more public opinion about that. Uh, but I think the, the uh, buck stops here. And I do think that um, the district ought to move forward as rapidly as possible without specific criteria. It's like asking, it's, a, it's, it's putting numbers into the equation before you even have the feasibility study started. And I can't see the value of putting limits or bookends on something that is still an open-ended question. And so I'm, 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 I'm gonna vote against the motion from the, from the general manager for that one specific piece where it says establish objective criteria. We may decide to do that, but I think doing it at this time is way too early and it handicaps the process. Director Riley, just a point of clarification. The general manager did not make a motion. He has made a recommendation. So the motion that is discussed tonight could be completely different, but, but go on. You're right, I'm, I've gotta learn the director's terminology here. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Um, but anyway, I, uh, my point's made, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to add to it if it becomes more of a discussion. But I'm, I'm not in favor of, of establishing um, uh, numerical criteria at this stage of the game. I would like to. Director Byrne? Well, I do think the consultants have to have some guidance in terms of what criteria they're supposed to be looking at, and it may not be specific numbers, but they do have to have some sort of um, direction for what they're looking for. So, um, <coughs> based on what George said, I'd, I could uh, suggest a modification to the, pers the recommendation by staff as to what we're supposed to do tonight. That would be that we receive the report and direct staff to con have the consultants recommended for hiring appear at the February board meeting and agree to discuss the possible establishment of objective criteria for the feasibility study in open session at the February board meeting. I think that gets to George's interest without coming to decision tonight and gives us an opportunity to have that discussion in a public forum at the February meeting. So that would be my motion. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. <coughs> Further discussion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Laredo. When can we discuss this openly in a manner of talking about some of these things these people have been talking about, the citizens have been talking about, like a citizen advisory committee? Uh, I think the supervisor probably want to talk about hiring consultants. What goes, when can we really get down and talk about all these issues that these people got com coming out? This agenda does frame subsequent action regarding preparation of a feasibility study. So if you want to discuss formation of a committee as part of that subsequent action, this would be a time that you could do so, or you could put that on a future agenda. Okay, um, so it go, it, we can start tonight, like you had some, supervisor had some stuff. I want to know about advisory committee. Do we want to have it? And I think that discussion is going to be a little long. <laughs> it's going to be a little long. And I don't think these people are ready for it tonight. But like I've been, to, like Mr. Beach said, we need to have a special meeting where we can hash all this out and the public would know. So what does the board want to do? I don't want to just slide by. I don't want the public to think we just sliding by you. You know, you come down here tonight and comment, and next February we're doing something else, moving this thing along. It needs to be moved along, but I want you involved. Well, that, that said, I'd uh, be willing to accept a friendly amendment to the motion to go ahead and have the formation of com committee formation as a topic of discussion at the February meeting incorporated in that motion. I do that friendly, to, uh, I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. You're so, making it, so. Well, I'll make it then, so okay. we can. Beautiful. And, and, and I'll make it on other issues that we need to do because we need to 
really discuss this in public. I, be, I believe our attorney told us we need to discuss it in public, and we need to set a time where we can really <coughs> hit on this so everybody can, we can get this out of the way and move it along. So I make a, min, uh, make a motion that we start that discussion next month. I'll, I'll, accept, that, I'll accept that friendly amendment. So thank you, sir. And is that friendly amendment to do that discussion at the February meeting? Yes. Or at a meeting prior to the February meeting? Uh, I'd say at the February meeting. I accept that. that. Uh, we may start early and stay late, but um, as long as we understand that. Director well, I Hoffman? Would second on that, and I, I wouldn't second it with um, a discussion of a um, subcommittee at this point. So, uh, okay, so procedurally, I guess we'll, um, you know, I've lost a second, um, or I can withdraw, you can withdraw the motion and, uh, and make a subsequent amend amending motion. Am I, I correct, I, I counsel? I would to help you out. Go ahead. Okay, so counsel. Well, as I understood, uh, Mr. Potter, you made the original motion. Right. And that was seconded. I understand the second withdrew, so if. You She's only withdrawing because he, uh, because of the friendly amendment. Uh, if I withdraw the friendly, <coughs> if I don't accept the friendly amendment, we either vote me up or down, or we have a subsequent amending motion. That's correct. Okay. So, are you saying you're not accepting the um, friendly amendment? In which case, my second was your still second stands. still stands. Okay. Well, Director Hoffman. Yeah, I guess um, as I read what the action is, is that. Um, the general manager provided the results of the listening sessions. And so our discussion is to discuss the results of the listening session. And then it says, and then says provide direction to staff on subsequent actions to be taken. Um, so I don't see at this point that we're discussing actions to be taken. As exactly. what this action is stating that we're supposed to be doing. So just as the maker of the motion and under clarification, you're, you're correct. Uh, the, any action other than receipt of the report was being deferred to the February meeting, including committee discussion, which we can do. And uh, the simplest thing to do is, is for uh, somebody else to second the motion and uh, that is in favor of the outline, I, uh, the friendly amendment I'd suggested. Or to just as you suggested, to say that the action is that the board accepts the uh, report from staff. Sure. Okay. And we we uh, and I amended the language to say and the possible establishment of criteria to address George's issue, um, and we can um, acknowledge that at that meeting we're going to have more discussion and we can deal with Elvin's issue without a formal motion. I think I'm I'm, I'm hearing that as direction that we want to go in. So I'm, I'm Sorry, my motion stands. I would let my second stand. Okay. Thank you, Gary, for the clarification. So I'd call the question. Receive the report, uh, direct staff to have consultants recommended for hiring at the February board meeting, and agree to discuss and possibly establish objective criteria in open session at the February board meeting. Do I have that motion correct? That is correct. Thank Good job. Thank you. And it was made by <laughs> Director Potter and seconded by Director Burns. So I still have some questions and concerns about the the consultants that we are going to be recommending come forward and I don't think I can vote on the motion until I have my questions answered Fine. Good. Good okay. so my questions then going to the um, the fact that we are going to direct staff to have consultants recommended for hiring and I just want to know some specifics I want to know what the criteria is for the consultants um, I want to know how the RFP is being distributed where it's being published and I just want to be sure that um, when the consultants come back <coughs> to us that there is a real straight description about the hiring process that we went through so it's it's criteria how it's being distributed and then upon the, the decision what the specific hiring process was good point Do you want to do a, a few comments through the, the process? I can answer all those. Um, there's a couple other uh, things. And I know 
bef before the vote, or do you want to vote first, or we just want those three answers? So we reviewed consultants. So you gave, at our previous meeting. yeah, to Mr. Beach's point, you have met on this topic before. Um, we met December 17th, and as a board, you authorized the process. There were draft RFQs and scopes of work in that packet. Um, so there's there's been that, and then publicly we discussed the types of consultants without naming the consultants who would receive uh, materials. At this point, um, all of them have received RFQs that we can provide in open session if we redact certain elements related to strategy. Um, there was much in what Mayor Carbone said that I think is very dangerous for negotiations. The two safe harbors that are out there for this purpose from the Brown Act, one is threatened litigation. As you all know, I've shared uh, emails with you on this. And the second is real property negotiation, which is a much more narrowly defined. But if you remember the line in the, in the California Code under real property negotiations, nothing in this section shall prevent you from meeting on eminent domain proceedings in closed session under the other one, the threatened litigation one. And so we've been trying to draw a very fine line between <coughs> threatened litigation and strategy and openness. So we can provide RFQs with some redaction because there are certain questions that go to strategy, certain questions that go to um, tactics. The concept of revealing factual data and asset packages and what it is you're going after is very dangerous because now, now you're signaling what your negotiation strategy is going to be. So we're going to have to draw a very fine line between how public we can be. I think we can be very public on if, if we're willing to accept redacted RFQs because most of the questions that are being asked of these people are similar to what we said we were going to ask in the public sessions when we walked through. So most of them are there. We can, but. As we know, the public inquiring mind says, well, wait, there's a black box over <coughs> this question. What was there? I want to know what was there. So it's, it, you know, there's a challenge in that. Um, there's seven months remaining. The board has been involved. Um, the eminent domain attorneys provided review on the RFQs to position us uh, more favorably in the court of law. They've made some advice that we can share with you that m also makes it difficult to just open up everything. Um, conflict of interest has been asked in all of the RFQs. Um, and again, to several requests for transparency, I think we've had discussions about what can, what can we do. We want to do as much as we can publicly, but we have to be very circumspect. Um, Mr. Narigi's letter appears on page 192 of your packet. There are specific questions that I had planned to answer on behalf of the district, which I, I will continue to do. Uh, so going to the motion and the discussion about advisory panel or um, having more than one discussion about criteria, objective criteria, we have time to wait <coughs> because the process, remember the process was outlined, do evaluation, convert it to debt, and then put it in a cost of service model. Those are facts. Those are just things that don't judge their own outcome. So once we do the cost of service model, then you can look and say, well, am I getting savings in the first year and every year thereafter? Am I getting savings after the fifth year? When do I get savings? How, how much can I pay and not get savings for 30 years? I mean, we can, the objective measures can happen three or four months into this. So we do have time to discuss it at a February meeting and discuss it again at a March meeting. You know, this process is going to be getting folks together in the first or second week of March, going on data gathering, trying to find good data, building models, doing the valuation. There's not a whole lot that we can even look at for a couple of months. So I think we have time to have those kind of discussions about when you want to set your objectives. Um, and now your specific questions. The criteria were set. They looked very similar to what was reviewed in closed session. Um, as I said, we can make that available with some redaction in open session. We've talked about that. Um, the RFPs have been all distributed. Um, Recall that they were distributed through your general counsel's office um, after being reviewed by eminent domain attorneys. So it's really their kind of attorney client product at this point. They'll be coming back to him. Um, 
They were all distributed after the recipients signed non-disclosure agreements. One of the proposed recipients did conflict themselves out based on other work that they're doing and have done recently. And then the hiring, um, that hiring decision is yours. And so we will walk you through what we did and how we got there and whether or not you want to hire. We did talk about sole sourcing professional services versus um, larger RFPs. Uh, we did not publish the RFQ. We um, distributed it to pre-qualified firms that had the, the skill set. Um, as you get more into it, there's fewer and fewer firms who have the skill set, especially when one of them conflicts itself out. So it's a, it's a limited universe, um, but we will have statements of qualifications in each of the consulting areas for you to look at, and we'll, we'll go from there. But we'll do our best to um, give you every opportunity to make as much open and transparent as you can. I appreciate your response so much because I just want to make sure that everybody, sort of each side of the room, <coughs> since everything was split down the middle, I just want to be sure that there is no question that any side has that we have not been fair about choosing the consultant, that we have swayed to, swung, swung to one side or the other. So I feel confident with your, with your response, and I thank you there very much for that. And I do believe that it is going to be transparent now. Thank you. Through the chair, M Mr. Lorraine, you can't give us, or can you, or you can't give us that statue where we got this closed session stuff under? Yes, it's under the Brown Act. Okay, it's yes. under the Brown yes. Act. Just yes. want to make sure that the public know that it's under the Brown Act, and that's what we're following. And there's nothing wrong with like going through your office with these consultants, is it? Not whatsoever. Uh, the, we are preparing for anticipated litigation. Calam has made it very clear that they are not for sale, that if there's going to be an acquisition that has to be by eminent domain, there's a very specific process that needs to be followed. And just as we are trying to protect our confidential information, Calam is in the process of collect, uh, protecting their information. Calam had distributed information in the public utility proceedings. Calam has communicated to us asking under the uh, confidentiality confidentiality agreements that had been entered into that we destroy that data. Calam has closed a website that had all the exhibits uh, related to those proceedings. Calam is protecting its data. We need to be very careful with ours because you don't want to be negotiating against yourself. Uh, thank you. And, and just one more question to the general manager. We have a little bit of time where we can discuss a citizen's advisory committee out there. Do do. Okay, thank you. I'm satisfied now because we need to move ahead, but get this out to the public. Thank you. Director Hoffman. Yeah, just I think what needs to be clarified is that the process that our attorney laid out of how we went about advertising or selecting the consultants that we are soliciting uh, RFQs for is not the typical process. As Director Adams pointed out, normally, RFQs are published, as you'll note in the pine cone or in the weekly, you'll see other agencies locally, they just dis distribute it. So the process that we're using is not typical. It is unusual. And one more through, through, the, ch through the chair. Um, I hope the board, I mean, I hope, I hope the general manager can get with AMP. Division one, division two, and di 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 division five, they did tapes up. Let's try to get them and put them together. I don't mind looking at Division Three and Division Four, but I like to hear the comments of everybody. And I, I learn a little bit better by watching that TV, like, like Tom said. Um, you, you can look at it two or three times the way they run it. So we can get that going and get those showing, doing our, our meeting. <coughs> After this meeting is show, they can start showing those. So please, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I would just like to make the comment that the process we're taking is not unusual. It is very specific to the um, conditions that we have. Thank you, Director Byrne. Arlene, you had a comment? Um, Chair um, Evans, I just wanted to say that the recordings of Divisions 1, 2, 3, and 4 listening sessions are on our website. Fantastic. Um, so if you go to on the first page of our, uh, on our web page, 
fix the measure J button. Uh, if you click on that, it will come to a page that will tell that we give you notice. Thank you. And we're working on getting the audio from Division 5 also. Yes. Wonderful. We may have a recording of the Division 5. Okay. Thank you. We need a vote on the motion. So Director Potter had called questions. So all of those in favor? Aye. 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 Is this a roll? This isn't. No, no it's not a roll call. Okay. Uh, any opposed? And the motion carries. It's unanimous. It is unanimous. Thank you. So uh, moving on to item 16, consider approval of a re revised MOU for the integrated regional water management in the Monterey Peninsula, Carmel Bay, and South Monterey Bay items related to the integrated <coughs> regional water management program. Madam Chair, members of the board, um, this item is on page 219 of your packet. And you are once again being asked to uh, approve a revised memorandum of understanding for integrated regional water management in the Monterey Peninsula, Carmel Bay, and South Monterey Bay. And I think, Charlene, I guess you have. Um, so, uh, just briefly, uh, what is Integrated Regional Water Management Planning? Basically, it's a framework that allows stakeholders, agency, nonprofits, and for-profit entities within the region to come together and find ways of potentially uh, merging projects or addressing issues together um, using an overlap. I, between the strategies that each uh, entity has and uh, discussing benefits, partnerships, hydrology, and geography uh, within the region. Um, there has been, uh, since 2005, uh, an effort um, in the region to do integrated regional water management. And since that time, there's been a lot of cooperation, I think, between entities that, that wasn't uh, present uh, prior to 2005. Um, so the Monterey Peninsula region is uh, a small region um, it within the state. It's one of the smallest regions within the state. This map shows you the Monterey Peninsula uh, integrated regional or integrated region compared to the Central Coast region. The Central Coast, uh, the California is divided into nine hydrologic uh, units, and uh, the Central Coast unit is comprised of uh, San Benito County, um, Santa Cruz County all of Monterey County, um, San Luis Obispo County, and Santa Barbara County. And um, <coughs> so locally, the Monterey Peninsula region, uh, which was defined in 2005, um, includes all of the Carmel River watershed. And this map shows uh, that watershed um, in green, um, shows you the red boundary, <coughs> which is the water management district boundary, um, it includes the Seaside Groundwater Basin and includes part of uh, CSUMB, all of the Monterey Peninsula cities, and then a uh, portion of uh, un unincorporated Monterey County along Highway 68 and um, in the uh, uh, Pebble Beach and the Carmel Highlands. It's about a 350 square mile region. So what you're being asked tonight is to uh, approve a revised memorandum of agreement that uh, significantly expands the regional water management group that um, implements the regional plan. And so um, this slide is showing you uh, the, the organizations that have the asterisk are the organizations that are already in the regional water management group. And the other uh, entities the ones without the asterisk are the entities that have expressed an interest uh, over the last few months in joining that regional water management group and in assisting with implementing the integrated regional water management plan. 
So it's, it does significantly expand the group. Um, it, it's starting to look more similar to the same uh, group that implements the uh, Greater Monterey County Plan. So Monterey County is covered by two integrated regional water management plans. One for the Monterey Peninsula, as, as we saw in the previous slide, and the remainder of the county is in the Greater Monterey <coughs> County region. And they have, I think, I think it's about 24 entities, so slightly more than um, the, en the entities that would become part of this regional water management group. And many of the entities uh, shown here uh, that are in uh, that would be in this regional water management group are also part of the Greater Monterey County Regional Water Management Group. So you know that includes the Big Sur Land Trust, uh, Monterey One Water, the County Water Resources Agency, the Resource Management Agency, the Intercoast Water Management District. I think the RCDs in Greater Monterey County as well. So uh, you know what's the regional water management group supposed to do? Um, so it is um, tasked with implementing the Regional Water Management Plan. Uh, the, probably the more important uh, thing for this group to do is to come together and actually evaluate proposed projects that would be awarded grant funding, um, prioritize the projects, and then um, from that prioritized list of projects, select a, a group of projects for uh, submitting a proposal to the Department of Water Resources for grant funds uh, that are committed to this area from uh, Proposition 1. And under an agreement uh, between the entities, the regional water management, or the, the I'm sorry, the region, uh, uh, the integrated regional planning groups within the Central Coast region, under an agreement uh, to split funds up uh, that are dedicated to the Central Coast region, this area would get about an additional $3.7 million um, over the next few years for disadvantaged community projects and for implementing um, other projects that are not uh, disadvantaged community projects. So this group would be fundamental in <coughs> choosing the, the set of projects, ranking them, and putting a proposal together. And then they're also tasked with monitoring for compliance uh, uh, with the IRWM plan and any agreement that's uh, made between the Department of Water Resources and our local region. Um, so the recommendations here are to approve the uh, memorandum of understanding that's included in uh, the board packet, uh, which would add new members, um, and uh, which also outlines that MPWMD has a role as the lead for the Monterey Peninsula re uh, IRWM region. And this would authorize the general manager to make non-substantive changes to the draft MOU and execute the MOU. And so a non-substantive change might be somebody that has said they want to be part of the regional water management group decides to drop out, um, or there may be just language that other entities want clarified. And with that, uh, I'll end my presentation and answer any of your questions. I just want to add one thing. And if you can go back to the last slide, Larry, it's uh, oh, the bottom button. Maybe it's on. Larry undersold the second dashed line, MPWMD role as lead for Monterey Peninsula. This has not always been a very easy task because very little money has come through to this district from this program. Larry, Larry acted as lead negotiator on our behalf with all the Central Coast regions to get this funding agreement. So now we're in virtually insured of getting $3.7 million to come here. Larry's kept track of the other grant planning grant that we got, and it's not an easy process, and applying for uh, reimbursement is ch challenging as well. We have a second staff from Marine Hamilton who's involved now. So we have been... Uh, it's. You undersold it. We've um, been herding cats, you know, that term, um, getting all these folks together. But getting the funding commitment, getting first Big Sur Land Trust and now uh, Denise Duffy to uh, rewrite the plan and manage the solicitation, it's coming from his already overworked office in our district. I, I do want to give some credit to Big Sur Land Trust and especially Sarah Hartgrave. She, she really re-energized this IRWM effort and 
she went out to uh, uh, these entities that you see that have expressed an interest in joining this regional water management group and really helping further IRWM. She personally went to a lot of these entities, described the process, and really had you know uh, quite a, an effort at reaching out to them. And so it, it's really it, it was through her efforts that that we now have a much larger group and a, a probably a mo much more diverse regional water management group now. And, and where does she work? <laughs> <laughs> Or, you know, stole her away. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, I want to say thank you. Uh, and Dave, thank you for bringing it up. I know Larry works really, really hard and never tells us how hard he's working. So thank you for acknowledging him. Larry, thank you for your hard work. Uh, directors, do you have any questions of staff? Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Larry, the staff report said it was 4.3 approximately. Is it 3.7 the reality of what was originally 4.3 million? No, there's already been... It's $467,000 awarded to the region for disadvantaged community oh, projects. Okay, it was a disadvantaged piece that fell out. In the first round. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> so, yeah, but you're right, it's 4.2 total. Oh, great. Okay. That's good money. Any other questions from directors? <coughs> Director Hoffman. Yeah, Larry, um, are there any other changes to the MOU other than the adding of the names of the additional um, agencies? Uh, you mean between the. the Last yeah. version and uh, the, and this current version. Yeah, because I don't see I don't see where things were added and like highlighted. Mm -hmm. so oh right, um, you know, yes, I did. I do have one of those. Uh, I think the most substantial change was um, in the previous version. Uh, the eligibility for being included in the regional water management group stated that. Um, an entity should have authority or responsibility over a water resource in order to be part of the regional water management group. <coughs> That's been um, revised to just show that any <coughs> stakeholder that has an interest, not necessarily authority um, or responsibility, any stakeholder that has an interest in becoming part of the regional water management group can petition the regional water management group to uh, become a part of it. And what was the genesis of that, of needing that change? Um, the, well, the, it, it, it's kind of, the IRWM program has evolved from uh, basically through DWR's direction uh, as far as um, who should be included in a, a, a governing group. Initially, back in 2005, the requirement was you had to have statutory authority, two of the, you had to have three members, two of the three members in the regional water management group had to have statutory authority over water resources. They've now, and, and so I think what they realized was, okay, they're excluding a number of entities. For instance, Native American um, uh, groups might not have any statutory authority over uh, an area, but they certainly have an interest in what <coughs> happens when you're developing water resources. So the Department of Water Resources has moved now to be more inclusive in their um, governing structure. And so this is a reflection of not trying to exclude anybody from being part of this regional water management group. So it's basically driven by changes that DWR recognized were necessary uh, to expand the uh, stakeholder bo group? Both through the state through the proposition language and the state legislature um, giving direction to DWR and DWR staff interpreting um, what they're supposed to be doing as, uh, with the Integrated Regional Water Management Program. And do you know where that change was made in the document itself? I think it's in, so it should be in the section that talks about regional water management uh, the, constitu the, the constitution of the regional water management group. Um, I, let's see. Approach adoption. Um, I think it's. Section 6.12, Participation in Regional Water Management Group. <coughs> and now it says any qualified stakeholder may petition to become a, re a member of the group. 
um, and demonstrate an interest, responsibility, or authority over one or more resources within the region. Previously, uh, you had to have responsibility or authority in the previous MOU. Okay, I'm sorry, which section? Uh, section 6.12, it's on page 229. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, and so uh, basically now the, the, the Regional Water Management Group with this version of the MOU uh, could entertain any qualified, and, and I mean, qualified wasn't determined, but the Regional Water Management Group can probably determine if somebody's qualified or not to be part of a group. So the way it's structured now, um, the determination of whether a stakeholder is qualified, that decision rests with who? Well, the way it's structured now, um, for instance, uh, I think it's the, the Carmel Valley Association, which represents property owners in Carmel Valley, they, di they don't have a responsibility for water management or an authority. So under the current version, if the Carmel Valley Association wanted to be part of the Regional Water Management Group, they couldn't. So under this new version, Carmel Valley Association's expressed interest in part of being part of the Regional Water Management Group, they can be part of this group um, under this version of the uh, MOU. Okay, I just, my question was, who makes that decision of whether somebody's it's qualified? Oh, the Regional Water Management Group itself. So at a, oh, okay. a, at a meeting of the Regional Water Management Group, you can discuss <coughs> who's qualified and who's not. And uh, So if somebody comes in and says, I want to be a stakeholder, um, they, they, would, they, would, and they would appear at a Regional Water Management Group meeting and say, I want to be a stakeholder, and the Regional Water Management Group would say, what are your qualifications, and then decide whether they would accept uh, them into the group or not. Oh, okay. The only other comment I have um, would be that I think it might be a good idea that if there are any um, minor or non-substantive changes, that there be a requirement that the board be notified of those if they occur? Certainly, I think we, we could do that. We could bring the MOU back for ratification once it's executed with all the groups, um, if that's the proper. Uh, I was just more process. thinking along the line of just letting us know um, if there are changes, so that uh, we we know that we have the final. Yeah, we, yeah, we can send out a red line and clean. Yeah, I expect it to be a kind of a long process to get to final execution. Do any of the other directors have any questions for Larry for staff? Okay. Do any members of the public have any comments on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Motion to approve the staff recommendations. Second. Okay. We have a motion from Director Byrne and a second from Director Adams. Do we have any further discussion? Okay. We'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, motion carries unanimously. And we'll move on to number, where am I? 17 to discuss the district um, district attendance at the Association of California Water Agencies in Washington, D.C. <coughs> for the legislative conference, uh, February 26th through 28th. Do you want me to introduce it? Yeah. Uh, yes. So <coughs> traditionally, at least for the last five years, possibly six, um, we've sent a delegation back to the Association of California Water Agencies, or AQUA's Washington, D.C. conference. <clears throat> Usually in conjunction with that conference, we, um, depending on what our federal uh, agenda is, we'll either have an extensive number of meetings or a short number of meetings uh, with just our congressional delegation. I think last year it was Congressman Panetta's office with the congressman, uh, aide to Dianne Feinstein, uh, and aide to Kamala Harris, and one or two other meetings kind of bookended. Um, in the past, we've extended it for a day, for example, to meet with uh, NOAA for the National Marine Fisheries Service for a little lobbying on uh, some steelhead issues. Um, in discussion with board leadership um, a month or so ago, um, we talked about this year's and with all the changes in Congress and uh, where things are in our uh, 
federal strategy. Um, we spent the last really three and a half years uh, pushing Pure Water Monterey and pushing changes in the criteria of the federal Title 16 package. Um, we, we did separate visits on behalf of our uh, federal strategy. Uh, Supervisor Potter at the time uh, and Mayor Rubio were back for one series of meetings. I don't think we ever got lunch um, or <laughs> ate. Uh, Bob Brower has gone back. Uh, we did some meetings in October of 2016 that were very effective. The effectiveness of this trip um, for our lobbying efforts is not nearly as uh, good as going at some other time of the year. <clears throat> However, it's always been a, a, a perk or a benefit to a, a director, if you will. Uh, there's been an educational aspect to it. Uh, there's been a networking aspect to it. And typically, we at a minimum see one or two of our con congressional delegation uh, representatives. So there's, there's always been something good that comes out of it for those people who can make things good come out of it. We've had a couple of directors who said, it's a total waste of time. So this year, I think at a chair, vice chair <coughs> meeting, uh, we concluded that maybe it, the resources are better served uh, at some other time in the year and just send an email around to which a couple of uh, other directors said, well, wait a minute, let's talk about it. Are there any questions Dave, on this? Question, please. Um, I think I asked to uh, have this on the agenda mainly because I wanted to know what, what compares to going to Washington uh, in relation to going to the state. I mean, are there other regional or other options <coughs> that provide some similar opportunities? I'm not looking for going to Washington personally. But I don't know what other options there are. And I just wanted to get a picture of the year or kinds of things. Now, you're a troublemaker. <laughs> yeah. So typically every year around this time, about February, our legislative advocacy committee gets together and kind of charts a path. Um, in recent years where staff kind of had some path ideas, we presented a lot. Uh, you know, and, and we've met with both us and Monterey and One Water with U.S. Bureau of Reclamation staff in D.C. probably four times, uh, in California, the mid-Pacific region a couple of times. And it's been very effective. We're actually waiting. We, we were told we were on a list of 13 to get funded from a, a grant uh, as of three weeks ago, but the Office of Management and Budget came in and said, well, why don't we get more money to fewer numbers and had a proposal for four entities, and we don't know if we're one of those four or not. So it's one of these things where um, a lot of the, the knowledge about our program, Pure, Pure Water Monterey program, was from these visits. And then uh, we felt we were uh, unfairly treated under the criteria for Title 16, so we spent a great deal of time presenting our case about how unfair the criteria were to orphan coastal cities with small projects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a very different set of things that take place in those kind of discussions than at the state level where in 2012, 13, 13 I guess, uh, we began the process of getting a, a, a bill introduced by uh, Bill Monning at the time and carried through and that's what allows the securitization financing to go forward, the ratepayer relief bonds, um, within a seven year window of the approval of the CPCN. And that was extensive number of meetings at committees and with committee reps and with legislative aides to both the assembly side and the Senate side. So the focus is different at different times. Um, we do both when, <coughs> when we have a plan, um, but we don't always have, I mean, we are a small uh, entity and so we don't always have grand plans. Back when there were earmarks, um, you could really do well by federal lobbying. And, the Feinstein Win Act first draft actually <coughs> had the Pure Water Monterey project and the Calam Diesel project listed, almost earmarked like. That was removed from the final, but that was an effort to get our little communities, big projects <coughs> recognized. And so the goal of the senator's office was to, hey, let's get a little something for California. Um, and at the same time, there were a number of legislators like Jeff Denham and David Valadeo at the Valley who were carrying West-oriented um, legislation, water legislation forward. And so we'd be like, hey, us too, include us in what you can. <coughs> um, 
but the landscape's changing. Both didn't get reelected in this last go round, and so it's unclear who's going to carry the the torch for California. California's not really high on the favorites <laughs> list um, <laughs> right now in the federal government. So, and and we're a little past our prime on asking for more money for Pure Water Monterey. This is kind of the last round, so our federal strategy's changed a little bit. But um, there's always something. I, you know. Bob and Jeannie, I think you were with Bob at the time that they went out to Silver Springs, Maryland and said, you've got somebody locally writing a Carmel River steelhead recovery plan that's saying take out a dam with no studies, and it's not the San Clemente that Los Padres, with no studies, no environmental work, no nothing, no hearings, and the draft got revised. So it just depends on what our interests are, um, and sometimes there may, may be no interests. Thank you. Do any of the other directors have questions? Okay, I'll open it up for public comment. Good evening again. Tom Riley speaking as someone who used to work for Pentagon West in Honolulu. Um, the squawking wheel uh, does get attention, and if we've lost some of our representatives that could squawk the wheel for us, um, even though this smells of what we used to refer to as boondoggle, um, and there's no, you didn't discuss how much it costs, but I think that um, you know, trying to get grant money out of Washington, D.C., you explained a little bit of the hurdle. But if there are new elected officials that are going to have to lobby for us, um, and it occurs to me, uh, former Mayor Carmel, Jason Burnett, if we can get him out of the bullpen to talk to people he knows back in D.C., it might be worth it. So anyway, that's just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Good evening, Rudy Fisher from Pacific Grove. Uh, I'd like to speak in favor of, um, of this agency um, sending people to the uh, to this conference. Um, so years ago, I read a Latin phrase, serif audi, uh, dare to know. And I think conferences are always a good place to find out what's going on and to kind of compare it and find out that, oh, gee, I'm not the only one doing dealing with this. Um, but also, Dave Stolt talked about um, Paul Shooter going to Washington, D.C. and, mm -hmm. and as a former board chair for Monterey One Water, um, I used to love the fact that he was going to all those uh, meetings here in, in California and D.C. and every, every place else, both because he knew what was going on. He, he made a lot of contacts that could potentially be of help to us. But also, the, the, if we get the grant, for instance, for, for Pure Water Monterey, that goes straight to the cost of the, of the plant itself. That directly lowers the cost of the water from the plant the water to our rate, rate payers. So I think it's valuable to to have at least a couple of people go to something like, like this and find out more, make the contact, and you never know what you come up with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Anyone else wishing to speak on this? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion. Director Byrne. Well, I'm one of the people that um, brought this up, and I think it's really important. I mean, it has several different aspects. We have connections with the Aqua um, people out here, but the headquarters for Aqua is back in D.C., and it's a valuable connection, and it actually put us on the map where previously we were sort of non-existent. Um, our lobbyist is back there, and even though we don't have any particular thing, it's um, a great opportunity to touch base one-on-one -on -one with the lobbyists. I think it's really valuable with the change in Congress to be able to make connection with our new representatives. Um, one valuable thing that I think has been great every year that I've gone is the um, presentation by the California congressmen. Uh, it's about a 15, 20 minute presentation by each congressman and it really gives you a perspective of where California is and what we're doing. But it also, the overall conference gives you the perspective of where California fits in the national scene because the East Coast could really care less about California. They basically figure we did it to ourselves by not putting in reservoirs and they don't have a lot of sympathy. But when you're one-on-one -on -one with some of them, it does make a difference because you become a real person as opposed to just the far west. So I, I think it's important and I think um, the determination was that it would be up to three directors 
And I don't know, Dave, what's the what's the normal budget for this? <coughs> well, hotel is um, you know minimum of two nights uh, at you know your three to four hundred dollars a night, all, even with the conference room rate, and then the flights depending on how early and you you book them. Um, but it's it's generally a you know a couple thousand per person all in. But in terms of the benefits we've gained over the years, it's sort of a drop in the bucket compared to what kind of money we're talking about on every project. Mm -hmm. And if I can jump in on that, I think you had prepared um, for us last year a relative cost of the grants that had come out of that trip versus the cost of the trips. And I think it was a, you're right, it was a pretty <laughs> significant Return amount of grant. Return and on it, investment. And it, yes, yeah. thank you. That's the word. Yeah, it's, yeah it Good wasn't all, you know, all from one trip, though, so it's been right. you know, several. But mm -hmm. uh, what would really sell it is if they just give us the grant for Pure Water Monterey. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other director comments, Director Potter? So I'd, uh, I'd agree with Mr. Rowley's comments about the importance of introducing ourselves to new legislators. They don't want to show up late in the game. They want to keep that continuity going. Um, I, I do think that although we are a small district, we have an incredible suite of uh, projects that we've done. We, we actually lead in this state conservation-wise. We have aquifer storage and recovery. We've got desal plants that are up and running. We've got, uh, we decommissioned a dam. I think we've got a pretty good story to tell when we go around. Um, we irrigate you know, crops that are s distributed internationally with treated wastewater. World-class golf courses are treated with, wa with wastewater. I don't think there's a lot of districts that can boast of those accomplishments. And we get criticized a lot for not having done much, but in my mind, this district's done an awful lot, especially in the world of conservation. So I, I, I think there's an advantage to going a value. I think you did a good job of articulating what we did with Pure Water. The one thing that was great about Pure Water was it was the first partnership we'd ever gone out and really lobbied on together with a district that was right next door to us that we never did business with for decades. But with the change leadership here and the change leadership over there, we really partnered up, and I think that's something we should be celebrating. Thank you. Any other directors? So really, this is just a discussion item. There is no voting, but um, I would like to get a feel for the cons if there's consensus in the room one way or another. Yes, I would say. I, I think it's important. In favor of continuing the attendance. Okay. So Directors Hoffman. Okay. Director Edward, do you have an opinion? Are we going to continue on it, or we're going to vote on somebody going? You know, I, no, just I a feeling on whether when I've just sent that first email. <laughs> a feeling this, this on whether it's not an agenda is on not getting a, a vote. Okay. Just a, your uh, opinion is valuable. I, I, yes, I, I don't mind seeing somebody go, but we don't have to go to these every year. That's one thing I feel we don't have to go to them every year. We can save the money to do something else. I think it's a a, a residential. Senior residential need retrofitting, that we can use that money for them in Carmel. I thought it was going to be on this agenda, but it's it's not there. That retrofit for the seniors out there in Carmel somewhere. The one up Carmel Valley. Yes. Yeah. Um, don't don't don't. Talk. Yeah. We're still yeah. Well, don't. Well, it's not on the agenda, but I know it's <laughs> supposed to be coming forward. So right. I'm looking for money for that. So I have a okay. question. Thank you. So if we take a general consensus that it's important. It would be up to the individual directors to express interest in going? Correct. And I think there is a time sensitive element to it because there's. Um, well, when the notice came out, Arlene booked hotel rooms. Okay. And then when we sent the email out, she said, Well, I'll just hold off on <laughs> unbooking the hotel rooms. Yeah. So we still have those. Ready to go. I don't. We didn't do any conference registration yet. No. Yeah. Are we still within the early registration period? Um, I sorry, I would have to check. Oh, so I doubt it. Okay. Right. Anyway, I think it would be important for the new members in particular. Okay. Okay. Um, oh no, it's too cold. <laughs> it's too cold, and the government shut down. I ain't going. All right, here. direct. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Director Riley, I haven't heard your opinion on this. I'm not going to volunteer. Can I get your opinion on the general discussion topic? Oh, fine. No, for the, for the district, fine. For me, <laughs> <laughs> different. 
very well. Thank you. Okay, so I, I get I get the idea that there is consensus that it would be a good um, idea to continue. Uh, next discussion item number 18 is to discuss a memorandum from David Laredo, General Counsel on Smart Meters. Dave. Madam Chair, this uh, is on the on the agenda because uh, a speaker at the December meeting did raise uh, questions about the uh, Smart Meter program, uh, particularly expressing concerns about health effects of radio frequency emissions. Um, I will not take too long going over the memo, but uh, the smart meter program uh, originated with respect to the PG&E uh, electric meters. And in 2002, the PUC uh, initiated a policy making forum to consider these. Um, in 2005, uh, PG&E then in, uh, followed up the, with the policy direction and filed an application to deploy the, uh, the smart meter program. Um, the PUC uh, rendered a decision in, in uh, 2010 that found that the PG&E smart meter technology complied with FCC requirements and that in particular that there was no data to ex uh, suggest that exposure uh, exceeded the uh, federal exposure guidelines. Um, because of concerns that were expressed though about the smart meters, uh, PG&E applied to the commission in 2011 for an opt-out uh, option, and that was authorized by the commission, uh, but the commission did uh, authorize uh, the imposition of a fee for those individuals that opt out. So anyone that, that participates in the PG&E program can opt out and have an analog rather than a smart meter, therefore no emissions. Um, a question then arose as to whether or not uh, local governments could collectively opt out. And uh, in 2014, the commission uh, decided that uh, there was no authority for the uh, uh, local government on behalf of residents in their jurisdictions to collectively seek to opt out. And uh, there's a, qu a quote from that decision at the bottom of page 237 that clarifies that the commission holds power to regulate public utilities and this authority may not be delegated to another entity or public agency without statutory authorization, and there is no statutory authorization. Um, a question then arose as to whether or not uh, this would apply in the area of water utilities, and uh, a uh, application uh, to consider uh, that was not approved. Uh, so the bottom line, uh, in 2016, CalAM did apply in its general rate case for uh, uh, authorization to implement that that was denied by decision in 2018 but the Commission did encourage Calam to make a new proposal in some future GRC so at the moment as as your general manager explained to you last m meeting Calam does not have the Neptune smart meters because it was not authorized PG&E does have smart meters but the Commission has the exclusive authority to do so individuals can opt out Communities cannot opt out. This board has no discretion in this matter. It is an within the exclusive jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission. That summarizes, summarizes my report. Great. Thank you. Directors, are there any questions of council? Okay. I'd like to open it up for public comment on this item. Okay. Seeing none, does the board have any discussion on this? Okay, no, thank you for doing all the research. Uh, and so that pretty much concludes our agenda. Thank you for s hanging in there with me to the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you, directors. It's nice to have all seven of us. And uh, until next time, we are adjourned. Thank you.